Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, wasn't at church last week. Uh, God can do some things pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, been speaking with our son Adam and his girlfriend, and they have a wedding coming up. And um, Adam was laid off a lot lately, and so um, he ne- he was looking for some odd jobs to do around the house and so forth. And uh, you know, we, we we prayed about it. And n- normally, when I pray, I pray, and I'm Hopeful, you know, they don't all come true, but about an hour later, a job came through to work on a Sunday, and I was able to employ um, both um, him, Kenna, my son Christian, and a friend of mine, and there's still some more work to do. So God answers prayer, amen, and sometimes he answers it quick. I mean, it could, it could I don't think it was even an hour after we had prayed and they had been over here sharing uh, their struggle and so forth. And the cool thing was, is we, we offered him some money as a loan. He's like, I don't want to be in debt. I just want to work. That's something you don't see as much anymore, amen? So we do want to greet everybody online this morning. Hallelujah. All the things started this morning. Last week I tried to do it from a, a, a live stream uh, from remotely in, uh, where was I? Uh, Kenosha or somewhere over there. And... Uh, I, we had all sorts of problems, but this morning uh, things went a little bit better. Um, just one more prayer here. Dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your promises, Lord. I would just ask that this morning that your truth would be revealed and would shine the light on what it needs to be shed upon. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So this, this message I'm going to preach this morning is Jezebel. And again, I'll remind you, just, it was kind of funny because, well, so this Jezebel message, um, this is probably the fifth time I've tried to do it. Every time I've tried to do it, something's happened. I, and, and the last time that I tried to do it, I got COVID. So I woke up this morning and I'm like, all right. So then, you know, we got up this morning and um, I couldn't get to the dry cleaning in time because I was so busy this week. So I had to iron. So this morning I'm ironing and the, all the lights go out, blew the fuse, and then I left my coat at home and Diane's like, you don't need to preach with a coat, you can just wear a shirt. Um, and just a, other weird things. So um, it's a difficult subject in a sense, but it, it isn't really in what it is because there's a lot of it, is, it's, it's in the Word, and that's what we're going to learn here today. Um, but when I was, had the COVID, and I was, that's when I was finishing this message up, I, I want to remind you about that time Diana said, why are we talking about her? What's this dead person in the Bible have to do with anything? And I had to remind her, I couldn't because I was in the COVID fog, that all the people in the Bible are dead. So <laughs> um, um, we're going to be talking about the character. and um, Creation is in the Bible. Healing, what? Did you hear what I said just a couple minutes ago? All right. So, dear Lord, we we pray for PowerPoint right now. So what's that say? What is that over there? Can you drag it? And yeah, so yeah, oh boy. Hmm, this will be. Um, can I close? Yep, there's too many PowerPoints. Let's close all these windows. We're, we can do some online um, troubleshooting here. When PowerPoint isn't working, go ahead and open your task manager and then go and find the application and kill it. All right. <laughs> There we go. Kill it. Kill it. I will not be defeated this morning because God was never defeated. So <laughs> I'm going to keep fighting this morning. Fight through it. Uh. Anyway, here we go. Um, so... <clears throat> 
yeah, why would she care? Dead people dying. Uh, creation's in the Bible. Um, healing's in the Bible. And there is profound wisdom in Scripture. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16. <laughs> Yay? Okay. Uh, all Scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration of, to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outwitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the Bible also teaches us about the nature of God and how we should live our lives. Matthew twenty two thirty six starts, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, that is, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. The whole law and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. But the Bible also teaches us about the nature of the enemy and how the enemy can appear. In Matthew eight twenty eight, it says, and, and, when he, and when he was come to the other side in the country of Gergesenes, Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art, art thou come hither to torment us before time? And there, was a good, and there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. There is good and evil. Now, that parable... Um, with the pigs, I just, why didn't Jesus just kill the, the demons? Why didn't he, instead of sending him in the pigs and, and all that, um, I'm going to tell you why. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I do know that after Jesus defeated Satan's, Satan, right, and he, he came, he died on the cross, he was buried, he was resurrected, that the apostles were still casting out demons. So that means if the demons were around then. The demons are still kind of walking around here in the world. The time has not come for Jesus to send Satan and all the demons into the lake of fire until after Revelation. And I don't know that day either, if you were wondering. All right. Um, Acts 16, 16 starts, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to that spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. As I said, the Bible is our guide, and good and evil is going to be here until he comes back, and it's going to be all good, but I don't know when that is. But let's look at Jezebel a little bit. In 1 Kings 16.31, it says, And it came to pass, as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal king of Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. This marriage was a political marriage. Um, it was definitely not based on love. Uh, the marriage of Jezebel to him made her the queen of Israel, queen of God's people. These are God's people. But Jezebel worshipped Baal and not Yahweh, right? Um, and so that's not going to make God. And she had an impact on the culture there, creating division and helping people turn away from God. Now, this wasn't all Jezebel's fault. <laughs> I mean, Ahab allowed it, right? 
takes two to tango, you know, the whole Adam and Eve thing. Um, we need to understand that. And in 1 Kings 18, it, said, it says that, uh, Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab, and now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. This is where I really start to see the character of what Jezebel is, is about. Um, obviously, she's killing the prophets, and in so doing, the prophets are being hidden for protection. But what happens when they're hidden for protection from Jezebel? Jezebel wants to hinder the word of the Lord. Jezebel wants the word of the Lord to be unseen. She wants to make the word of God ineffective, if, that, if, if you could even do that. She wants to get people to stop talking about God and talk about other people. No word from God from the prophets. That's how God spoke in those days. So the, the affront to the Lord is, is quite fierce here. She probably wanted to stifle the worship of Yahweh versus Baal. Anything where God was involved, Jezebel wanted it destroyed. She wants Baal to be the supreme God and will stop at literally nothing to achieve this. Now, Elijah now says, hey, go tell the king I'm here. He's, he's feeling pretty confident today. Um, in chapter 18, it continues in verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, are you the one bringing disaster on Israel? And Elijah said, I have not brought disaster in Israel, but you and your father's household have by abandoning and rejecting the commandments of the Lord and by following the balls. Now then, send word and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah, who eat at the Queen Jezebel's table. Now, to re I'm not going to go through all that scripture. Um, I, I have before. To recap what happens, uh, they need to sacrifice two bulls. Uh, the odds are against Elijah. If you go to Numbers, 850 to 1, um, they scream and they cry all day long. Uh, they, they, they're cutting themselves, and Elijah calls out on their God to kind of tempt Baal. And in verse 27, I still love this. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry out with a loud, loud voice, for he is a God. Either he's occupied or he's out at the moment or he is on a journey. So <laughs> Elijah is very confident. Elijah is very connected to God in this moment. And this is important. Elijah is very much within the will of God. And Elijah seems to have a lot of faith. He tells them to put water on it, not once, not twice, but three times. Um, there's water everywhere. It says that the trenches are filled with water. And then Elijah prays to, not Baal, to the Lord. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering in the wood, and even the stones and the dust had also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell face downward, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. They seized him, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and as God's law required, killed him right then and there. Full of faith, full of victory, and, it even convey, and then he even conveys there's a rain coming that's going to solve the drought problem that they have there. But all, that's a lot of dead prophets. I, they're probably prophesying for the wrong person. But in the very next turn of the page, in the very next moment, um, and isn't it like that sometimes? You know, you're on fire for God. You're, you feel in the presence of the Lord in your life. You're going to prayer meetings. You may do doing more Bible studies. You feel like you're in that kind of, it's not a zone, but you just feel full of the Holy Spirit and everything seems going pretty good. And then the page turns. And the page turned for him here in verse 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elisha had done and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So what do we see here with Jezebel? Jezebel's furious. 
Jezebel was made to look bad. She doesn't want to look bad. God obviously got the glory in this incident where all the, the prophets were killed, and she doesn't want God getting any glory. And this was an epic move of God in the land, a true testament, not only of his power, but he was really real. The attention was not on her or on Baal, but on God. She and those that followed Baal were embarrassed, and people were focused on the greatness of the Lord. So how did Elijah respond? Because, you know, just a minute ago, he, called, he prayed, and the prophets were dead, and he's like, you know, he is pretty happy. And when he saw that, talking about what Jezebel is doing, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. fathers. What's Jezebel causing here in one move? She's causing fear in one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. You know, I, I'm not going to put him in a ring with another prophet to figure who, who's the greatest, but one of the greatest. Um, you know, a little bit ago, he was standing for the Lord against 850 other prophets, and now he's ready to, res- to surrender. Jezebel is casting doubt into his life. And condemnation, condemnation should come from the Lord, but Jezebel is giving condemnation because he's saying, for I am not better than my father's. Did anything change from the time that he brought the fire down with God? No, nothing changed. And he's feeling unworthy, and that's brought on by Jezebel. And have you ever had the page turn on you in the will of God, doing the next right thing, serving and praying? I have. But I need to understand that some of it is coming from someone else. It's not God, it's someone else. And it could be someone just like Jezebel and what Jezebel did to Elijah. I'm not a prophet. I'm not going down that road. Um, One more example of Jezebel. Ahab wants a vineyard. Um, The owner, and I'm not going to go through all the scripture there, but the synopsis is Naboth is the owner, and he was a Jezreelite. Uh, Ahab wants a vineyard converted to a garden. He wants to trade it. Dude says, nope. He wants to buy it. The guy says, no. And Naboth says, why? The Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab is kind of, we already know Ahab's kind of a a wimp in a certain way, but Ahab's depressed, right? Ahab's a little disappointed. He doesn't want to eat anything. And Jezebel says, what's the matter, baby? Well, not really. (laughs) In 1 Kings 21.5, it says, And Jezebel, his wife, came to him and asked him, Why is your spirit so troubled that you have not eaten? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now reign over Israel? Get up, get food, and let your heart rejoice. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Jezebel does not care what is honorable. Jezebel does not care what God says. So what does Jezebel do? Nothing good. I'm going to paraphrase one more time. Jezebel writes letters in in Naboth's name. Jezebel is stealing his identity. Jezebel forges signatures with his seal. Jezebel puts two men beside him, uh, worthless and unprincipled men. They lie. They say that uh, Naboth uh, cursed the king. They say that uh, they cursed God, and they renounced the king, and they renounced God. And long story short, Naboth is stoned and killed. And Jezebel gets her way, and Ahab gets his vineyard. There are people in this world that have the same characteristics as those in the Bible, and we need to pay attention. We need to be wary, or why would it not be in the Bible? The characteristics of Jezebel are still working today, and they are in the church They are in the family, they are in the businesses, they are in schools, and they are in our community. And we need to be aware of them to protect our church, families, and businesses, schools, and our community. And most importantly, to protect our relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The things that I take away from Jezebel is, (coughs) to help identify it in a sense, is Jezebel is all about control. It can be subtle, 
or it can be aggressive, but Jezebel wants to control everything. Um, Jezebel will use false accusations or lie, is the, the word we're most familiar with. Um, Jezebel will use sedu- seduction if it's possible. She'll use any, or, or that person would use anything to get their way. Jezebel wants to create isolation, creating doubt, creating fear. I mean, look what it did to Elijah. Jezebel will try to corrupt the godly. That's her biggest target. Jezebel will try to destroy the the godly. Um, Jezebel will draw the tolerant, and that's Ahab. That's a whole kind of subject, but, I mean, Ahab let it happen. And a person that operates like that will want people that they can manipulate, that, that, that can be easily directed. And um, Jezebel, you're going to see casualties. I mean, we know that Jezebel was a murderer, but a spiritual, spiritual casualties. Uh, Jezebel in a church can cause a tremendous amount of damage by getting in the way of someone's relationship with Christ Jesus. Um, and, you know, as far as Jezebel is concerned, she, she doesn't care. She's unrepentant. Jezebel hates to lose. Look at the reaction to Elijah in the victory. Jezebel likes to create confusion. Naboth, you know, he was brought out and had to endure endure so many accusations. And he thought he was at a party. And then he was snared in an ambush and he got dead. So Jezebel wants to create confusion. Jezebel loves fear. Um, The greatest enemy for Jezebel-minded people is people who are moving towards God. And that's who Jezebel really wants to get after. And they want to contain those on fire for God to put that fire out. Now, there's a warning in in Revelation 2.20. It says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that that woman Jezebel, which call her, calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now, this is not the actual Jezebel of the Old Testament. That one was dead. This is a warning for the modern church. Um, Churches are elevating man above God, it seems to me. Can you go to the next slide, Jeff? So this is, I, 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 I used to listen to Stephen Furtick a lot. And I repented of that. <laughs> um, and I'm not attacking the man, but I'm attacking some of the thought process here. This is their youth group uh, coloring book. Um, and there's a whole video that goes along with it. And uh it says, oh, where did I type that? Maybe I didn't type that. Can you go to the next slide, Jeff? There, nope, okay. <laughs> go back to the other slide, sorry. So, the, yes, go back to that one, I'm sorry, Thirteen one. yes. On top it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, granted by his permission and sanction, and those which exist have been put in place by God. Okay, that's good scripture. Can you go to the next slide? On the bottom, there's another one. Go ahead. Elevation Church is built on the vision God gave Pastor Stephen. We will protect our unity in supporting his vision. Now, <laughs> now I know that uh, when Jeff and, and Mike started this church, they had a vision, but I don't think we need to bow down to them. Uh, it, uh, a lot of these churches, and I'm not just saying Elevation Church, but many churches uh, are built on the vision of one man or one person, and a church really should be built on God's vision and God's word. Amen? Amen. And unfortunately, a lot of churches too now are conforming to world doctrine instead of the doctrine of God. Um, God's people are not meant to conform to the will of society, but rather the will of God. Um, And the inclusive church is kind of the biggest challenge I'm seeing uh, throughout the nation. Many churches are becoming accepting of transgender and homosexuality and so forth. And um, 
<clears throat> some seem to be forced and some are just, they're embracing it. They're embracing it and they're discounting God's word. Um, I remember a very painful, well, kind of painful conversation with a family member about, you know, why won't you let people get married in your church if they're gay? And I said, well, we don't believe in gay marriage. And they're like, well, um, they're, they're in love and they're not hurting anybody. And I'm like, you know, they kind of are. They're hurting God. See, God has a set of rules and we want to follow those rules. And if I allow them to do that here, then I'm saying, God, your rules don't matter. And that is why this church changed their, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, bylaws that we don't have to do that. We, we, we won't do that. And we will stand on God's word because you don't get to do that here because it, God says no. I wish God said yes, maybe. I, if it would make life easier, but God, he, he hasn't said that yet. <laughs> um, and, and I'm finding, too, that uh, <clears throat> there's kind of a perversion of the word of God lately. Um, go ahead, Jeff. And you're going to click play, I hope. One more time. It's not a very good picture of them right there. All right. Houston, you got to get your mouse over onto the other screen. No? Okay, guess what? I have a backup plan. All right. Can I drive for a second? No. Oh, you just killed the live stream. <laughs> no. Okay, give me one more sec. I'm sorry. I apologize for the inconvenience. Um, yeah, that's all right. And we go here and copy. And I'll just tell you when to kill it, okay? And we got we to gotta get it queued up because we don't want to have any weird commercials come on because, yeah, yeah. In the, oh, this is, a ni- this is a nice commercial, actually. Okay. All right. All right. And that's one, one thirty six. Now we're going to go over here. Oh, we got to minimize. PowerPoint's got to go down. Oh. Technology is awesome. Oh, come on. <laughs> how, how do we kill that? Maybe I can just drag it over. Oh, Lord, help us. There it is. You can stop it there, Jeff. Uh, do you need help? <laughs> uh, that was enough to hear, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'll tap four. Are you over there? There we go. All righty. <clears throat> I do I <clears throat> I do like that move. And he's got some guns, right? He's got some gun I mean and <clears throat> he's a very very good speaker. He's animated. He's a motivational speaker. Um apparently he has $3,000 tennis shoes. Um I I don't care about all that, but I do care about God's word and what confusing people about God's word. Now, I I didn't go through and listen to the very I didn't have you listen to all of that, um, just for time's sake. But he was in that first-person mode. So when he said, I am God Almighty, even if he was trying to say, 
The Lord is saying, I am God Almighty. I didn't make you. It was very unclear. It's wrong. Um, I don't think I'd ever say that in a sermon. Would you, Dad? Would you, Mike? <laughs> um, so that's something that's very concerning as of late. And um, there's another guy, Chris Volatin. He's from Bethel. I think that's the slide. Yep, there it is. The word of knowledge in the Song of Solomon is the same Hebrew word, knowledge, is translated bedchamber. Why? Because this knowledge isn't coming from classroom. It's coming from the bedchamber, and it's coming from intercourse with God. I don't know if they try and do that for attention or what, what's going on, but it seems to me they're kind of perverting the word of God and trying to make it, See, uh, like church-like elevation, they'll tell you we're all about metrics. They're, they they have like these uh, goals and everything, and 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 that's I don't I'm not jealous of elevation that they're a big church, but I'm concerned for people if they're not getting all of the truth. Um, and God knew all this would happen, right? Amen. First Timothy four four says, but the Holy Spirit explicitly and unmistakably declares that in later times some will turn away from the faith, paying attention instead to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. Such as grave soaking or sucking. Anybody hear of that? You can go to that picture. So <laughs> grave soaking or sucking is where people believe they can lay on a grave of someone that was anointed, um, like an old pastor or preacher, and lay on it and soak up their anointing. Um, I had more pictures of that, but I'm not. I didn't. I don't want to do whatever. Or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, that's actually a thing. Just so you know, um, seances, psychics have all been minimized by society and are are now deemed normal. When really. Uh, we know that things like grave soaking and going to a psychic and trying to talk to the dead is wrong because it's in the Bible. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18.10 starts, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire as a sacrifice, one who uses divination and fortune-telling, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who casts a charm or spell or a medium or a spiritist or a necromancer, who seeks the dead. For everyone who does these things is utterly repulsive to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. Now maybe the grave-soaking church, I'm not going to name that church right now, maybe the grave so well, yeah, I will. Maybe the grave-soaking church of Bethel should have read that in their Bible. Can you go to the next picture, Jeff? Yeah, except that's their Bible. That's the Passion Translation 2020 edition with a foreword by Bill Johnson. I didn't know the Bible needed a foreword. Um, and the problem with the Passion Bible is they can't read Deuteronomy because it doesn't exist in that Bible. They have the Psalms, they have the Proverbs, they have Isaiah and the Songs of Solomon, and then everything else is a New Testament. Kind of convenient to leave out some of the rough stuff in the beginning, isn't it? Another thing that's happening, too, that I'm seeing around um, that Jesus is probably not happy about is the acceptance of Eastern medicine, uh, you know, yoga and things like that. I, don't, I didn't look up the other names because I don't really care that much for it. But yoga is an ancient Hindu religious practice intended to unite a person's soul with the impersonal, universal force Hindus call God. They don't call him Yahweh. They don't call him Jesus. And I'm not trying to give glory to Jezebel. I'm just trying to give us all a warning of what to watch for. For the record, uh, Jezebel loses. <laughs> Elijah declares a word in 2 Kings 9.10. The dogs shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. And then a uh, guy comes up, and she tries to use her seduction and stuff, and uh, the guys throw him off the roof, and then Second Kings 9.35 says, They went to bury her, but they found nothing left of her except the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Because of what, though? Why did that happen? Because of a word of the Lord. That happened because God is faithful. That, ha that happened because God is faithful to his word. Because God will always be triumphant. Amen? Elijah remembered who he was because God is faithful. 
because because Elijah got out of the cave. I'm sorry. First Kings 19.9 says, Then there he came to the cave and spent the night in it. And behold, a word of the Lord came to him, and he, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And to kind of just recap, he goes out, and there's some wind. No God. Um, there's an earthquake. No God. There's some fire. No God. But then he hears a word from the Lord. It's in God's word where the victory is. And in, in, in his word, Elisha could move forward. And in, in God's word, we can move forward. Um, I know I hit you with some weird stuff this morning, but it's the truth. And we need to be cognizant of it. We need to know where our kids are going to. What? Yeah. In your opinion, are those churches that you showed us using the Jezebel spirit to confuse people? I don't know. I just, I'm, there's, the Jezebel I'm talking about is mostly about a person, right? But. We looked in Revelation and we we heard we saw about Jezebel. So I wanted to kind of bring the two together, because here's the big takeaway. Um, back in chapter 16, um, when 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 they cast the demon out, it happened when they were going where to a place of prayer. Jezebel is always going to be trying right in the mix in the middle of the people that are going to church because you're the targets. Amen. And Jezebel, I don't think Jesus put Jezebel in the Bible twice by mistake. I think we need to be cognizant of, one, the physical Jezebel, and then more like the church Jezebel. Now, these churches, some of them, I believe, are um, have a passion for God, and maybe they just got misdirected. But when you take the word out of the equation when you're trying to um, lead people to salvation in a relationship with Christ, and you take the Bible, and then you just say, you know what? I'm going to cut this part out. I don't like that part. You can't take away from the Word of God. You can't add to the Word of God, or you're in trouble. Um, but, yeah, so <clears throat> those churches would be red flags. So if you ever move anywhere, I would be concerned if you would want to go to a church like that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it happened when they were on the way to a, pl uh, a place of prayer. The enemy was messing with one of the greatest apostles, right? <laughs> um, he was completely in the will of God, amen? And the enemy will attack the people of God no matter what because Jezebel doesn't care. I am not calling anybody here Jezebel. I'm not going to say online somebody's a Jezebel. I'm just reading the word and telling you what I saw, and I'm sharing that. And all I know is our God is greater. Amen. And his word is true, and all of it's true. And if all of that's true, you've got to read some of the boring chapters. <laughs> you know, but you can still learn something. The worship team can come on up and... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to end with one scripture, and I know I hadn't had a lot of scripture. Well, also, for those watching online, if you haven't been to church yet and been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, we are in Acts 2.38 church, and we believe that you need to be dunked and filled. Um, <laughs> that's what we believe. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Philippians, this isn't on the screen. Uh, Philippians 3.17 says, Brothers and sisters, together, follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave you. For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, sensuality, and their vanity, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and temporal things. But we are different because our citizenship is in heaven. And from there we eager, eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by exerting that power which enables him even to subject everything to himself, 
will not only transform, but completely refashion our earthly bodies so that they will be like his glorious resurrected body. Amen. If you need prayer, I know there's people around here who will come pray with, pray with you, and the altar is open.